Tonight, we'll learn about two very different but thematically similar works of fiction that explore the ways in which the ever-present past changes and enriches the identities of two seemingly singular protagonists. Our first presenter, Mary Morris, has been called a marvelous storyteller for her numerous novels, short stories, and travel memoirs. Her works of fiction include A Mother's Love, House Arrest, and most recently, The Jazz Palace. She is winner of the Rome Prize for her story collection, Vanishing Animals, and the Ainsfield Wolf Award for Fiction. She is also the author of the travel classic, Nothing to Declare, Memoirs of a Woman Traveling Alone. In her new novel, Gateway to the Moon, Morris interweaves the story of a secluded New Mexican town's present-day residents with those of its original settlers 500 years earlier. A literary purveyor of the past, with a passion for the city of brotherly love and sisterly affection, Nathaniel Popkin is the author and co-author of five books, including the novel Lion and Shepherd, Song of the City, and Philadelphia, Finding the Hidden City. He is also co-editor of the forthcoming literary anthology, Who Will Speak for America, and the writer, editor of the Emmy Award-winning documentary film series, Philadelphia, The Great Experiment. In his latest book, Everything is Borrowed, Popkin ponders regret, history, and the intransigence of the urban landscape through the strangely parallel lives of two men separated by centuries. Please welcome our first guest, Mary Morris. Hello, thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. And thank you, Andy, and the Philadelphia Free Library for having me. Um, a few years ago, I was in a little bit of a literary slump. I just finished The Jazz Palace, and I thought, you know, it's kind of like when you fall in love, you don't think you're ever going to fall in love again. Well, that, that was my experience anyway. Um, and uh, I like to go to the Morgan Library in New York City. And the Morgan Library is a wonderful library for writers to go to or artists to go to because it, it has to do with process. And they had a wonderful exhibit of the, mem the, the journals of, of writers. And there was a Herman Melville journal that was open. And it was open to a, a page where the sentence read, yesterday I saw a whale. And I thought to myself, every writer has to be in somewhere, right? I mean, obviously, he began by seeing that whale when he was sailing on a whaling ship. And then Moby Dick came from that. Not to make a comparison exactly with Gateway to the Moon, but it was around this time. I keep very accurate, careful journals. And I always mine them for new work. And my husband and I had lived in New Mexico in 1990. And so this was about four years ago. And I had brought the journals out. And I was kind of going through them. And I realized I hadn't mined my Mexico, New Mexico journals. And I found a sentence in one of them that said, we hired a babysitter. And then I remember that that babysitter was about a 16-year-old boy who um, he was tall and lanky, and in the afternoons he'd come and, and hang out with our daughter while my husband and I worked. And once he realized that we were a, a Jewish family, I mean, we're a Jewish family in the sense that we are secular Jews, he began to ask all kinds of questions. And he asked, for example, do you eat pork? And we would say, well, I don't really eat that much pork, but my grandmother would never eat pork. And he would say, well, my family doesn't eat pork, and we, we're Catholic, and we come from the hills in New Mexico. And I would say, that's really interesting. Like, why is that? He said, I don't know, but we don't eat pork. And then he'd ask me, do you like candles on Friday night? And I would say, no, we don't like candles. We like candles on Friday night. And he would say, so does my family. And slowly it came to me, he began to say that he felt that his origins were Jewish. And it's not that I wanted to be a Jewish writer per se, but I'm very interested in buried histories. And I think that we all have a lot of buried histories. I mean, my, my parents named me Mary so that people wouldn't know I was Jewish because of my name. Um, so I'm sort of interested in how we hide our histories and what our real histories were. I'd kind of forgotten about that babysitter, and then I sort of started to remember him, and once I remembered him, I decided to sort of dig into that whole question of what has come to be known as the secret Jews or crypto-Jews of New Mexico. Their history, um, I may just read you the short historical passage at the beginning of the book, because I think that will explain a little bit better. Um, once I started to dig into the history of the secret Jews of New Mexico and how they got there, they came with the conquistadors, they'd been there for generations and generations, how they got there and how they forgot they were Jews. And once I began to dig into that, it took me to the Spanish Inquisition. And once I got to the Inquisition, I couldn't avoid Columbus. 
And once I got to Columbus, I was down a rabbit hole, basically. Um, I remember at one point saying to my husband, I don't want to write a historic novel. I want to write a novel about the present time story of this boy, Miguel, which is the name of my main character, who comes to work for a family. And I said to my husband, could I just not write a historic novel? He said, you could definitely not write a historic novel, but it won't be as good a book if you did a historic novel. So I agreed to do it. I went into it. I dug deep. Um, and for the last three years, I have immersed myself in the story of what these secret Jews are and what their history is. And I find it utterly fascinating. I don't know if, if everyone does, but to me, um, who we are and where we come from, I mean, I think a lot of Americans, like I don't know where my ancestors' bones are buried, and I think a lot of us don't know that. And one of the things that when we lived in New Mexico, I met a man who knew where all of his generations were buried for hundreds of years. And I thought, I wanted to sort of open up some of these secrets and start to try to understand um, some of the secret histories. So I'm just going to read the historical note to Gateway. In 1492, with the Alhambra Decree, King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella ordered all Jews and Muslims to convert to Christianity or be expelled from Spain. It was their decision, along with the Vatican, to make Spain an entirely Catholic nation. It is estimated that among the Jewish population, 100,000 converted, the Inquisition killed another 30,000, and hundreds of thousands fled. Of the Jews who converted, many were Christian only in name. They practiced what the Inquisition referred to as the dead law of Moses and became what are known as secret or crypto-Jews. As the New World was being settled, crypto-Jews followed, making their homes in, New Mex in Mexico City and Nuevo Leon. But as the hand of the Inquisition reached farther into Mexico, some of these crypto-Jews moved north into what would become New Mexico. We're talking 1560. They lived as Catholics in the remote hills while still maintaining their Jewish traditions. Eventually, they forgot that they were Jews. Though they continued to practice Jewish rituals, such as lighting candles on Friday night and the refusal to eat pork for generations, they did not know why. And so that's the historical basis of this novel. Um, and a lot of research and a lot of work has been done on the crypto Jews over the last number of years. But um, um, anyway, I've, I've sort of become fascinated with their, their histories. And, and a lot of them now actually are, the, uh, the New Mexico Historical Museum recently had a exhibit about the crypto Jews. And for example, um, they interviewed a Catholic priest who had his DNA done and realized that his ancestors were Jewish. And essentially what would happen, and this was true with Muslims also, but what happened with the, with the Jews when they got up to New Mexico was it was a true liability to have Jewish ancestries. I mean, the, the, the descendants of the Jews were called new Christians, and if you were you know, always Christian, you were called old Christians. And to be a new Christian, there was always a liability. So uh, eventually the families decided not to even bother telling their children what the heritage was. So, um, so I'm going to read two short passages from the novel. Um, they both involve job interviews. Uh, they're job interviews that are 500 years apart. Um, so part of the structure of, of Gateway to the Moon is that there's a place called Entrada de la Luna, which is, uh, I translate as Gateway to the Moon. And it is, an, it is a made up place, but there is an actual place in New Mexico where Coronado, when he made his journey up into the United States from Mexico, um, and discovered, among other things, the Grand Canyon, he stopped in a place in New Mexico and he said that, he looked up at the mountains and he said, this place looks like it's the, entry, it's the way to the moon because of the way the mountains cup the moon. So it's a sort of historical you know, basis. Um, I like to take the sort of historical and then kind of invent around it. So, I mean, much of this novel is, is invention, most of the novel is invention, but it's, there's a lot of historical um, basis. Um, so this is, so there's a 1992 narrative and then there's kind of 1492, it's about 500 years apart. So this is 1992. Um, there's a boy named Miguel, he's 14 years old. He shouldn't be driving a car, but he does. He goes to a bodega in his remote village where he sees an, a sign that says, babysitter wanted. He answers the ad and this woman says, please show up on such and such a day. And she's gonna give him a job watching her two young sons, not asking him for any references or anything about him and not even knowing his age. So Miguel, so this is his job interview. 
Miguel pulls into the dusty drive in front of what seems to be a small adobe house. But in Colibre Canyon, looks can be deceiving. The canyon is named for the many emerald and ruby-throated hummingbirds that flit among the cactus blooms, plunging their beaks into the flowers. There are also snakes ready to inject their venom. Sometimes people get lost in these canyon roads, wandering out into the desert. A few years ago, a toddler slipped out of his yard and was never seen away again. It is said that wolves have returned to the hills, or if you believe the natives, wolf spirits. But the people who live out here mostly come from Texas or California. They never think much about such things. They are people with money, people with alarm systems and fancy cars and designer dogs, people who feel safe within their adobe walls and behind their automatic garage doors. Across the road, Miguel notices the work truck and men who appear to be drilling a well. They glance his way, and he gives a wave. They wave back. It is what strangers around here do. He slams the car door and walks up the path. Before he can knock, the door opens, and Rachel Rothstein holds out her hand. I heard you drive up. You always hear people drive up on this road. It seems like an odd thing to do, but he shakes her hand. Her long red fingernails press into his palm. So you're Manuel? She nod, he nods, not bothering to correct her. He will next time. He expected a thin blonde woman. He has no idea why he thought she'd be that way. Maybe because he imagines most white women who have money and hire babysitters will be tiny with eating disorders and watery blue eyes, but she isn't. Rachel Rothstein is a fleshy woman with large hips and breasts. She has such dark hair and eyes that if he'd seen her in Entrada when she was posting her ad, he would have taken her for Hispanic, maybe even someone related to him, except that she is wearing black tights and high leather boots and a pale green blouse with a green cardigan sweater. Her dark hair is wrapped in a tight bun on the top of her head. No one in Entrada de Luna dresses like this, not during the day, maybe for a fiesta, but not at four o'clock in the afternoon in your own house. He wonders if she dressed up for him. Despite how stylishly she is dressed, behind her he sees piles of Legos, trucks, trains, cars, stuffed animals, and plastic pistols and swords tossed all over the living room floor. And he sees a huge picture window with a vista that looks out onto the mountains and notices that the house has wings that jut out on either side. He is right, looks are deceiving. Mrs. Rothstein pulls the door back to let Miguel in, but he has hardly stepped inside when he is ambushed. A small boy wearing a mask and cape carrying a laser gun latches onto his legs and tries to drag him to the floor. I got you, the boy says. Miguel raises his arms in surrender. I come in peace. The boy eases his grip. I'm Captain Chaos. Miguel extends a hand. I'm Captain Kirk. What is your mission? That seems to stump the boy. As he eyes Miguel, Mrs. Rothstein smiles. Why do you want a job, she asks. Miguel looks at her oddly. What a stupid question. Why does anyone want a job? Because they need money, because their deadbeat father rarely comes around, but perhaps this woman does not understand the concept. I'm working on a science project, and I need to buy a telescope, he tells her. A telescope. She mulls over the word and then smiles again. This is Davy. She slips the mask off the little boy and a pair of deep blue eyes stare at him. And please call me Rachel. Miguel nods, biting his tongue. He's never called anyone more than five years older than himself, anything other than Mr. or Mrs. or doctor or professor or officer on the occasions when he's had dealings with the law. He knows he'll never call her by her first name. That's interesting, she says. So you want to be an astronomer? Miguel, Miguel is a bit of an amateur astronomer. Miguel shrugs as he follows her. He hasn't really thought that far ahead. I just like to look at the stars, he replies. He follows her through the obstacle course that is the living room, where an older boy with reddish hair and pale skin sits glued to the TV. That's Jeremy. Jeremy, say hello. The boy waves hi without looking up. As Davy plunks down beside his brother, Jeremy gives him a pinch on the arm that Miguel catches a glimpse of. Tears in his eyes, Davy slides away, rubbing his arm. Mrs. Rothstein doesn't seem to notice, or if she does, she decides not to do anything. Perhaps she's already given up on some things. Miguel isn't sure as he traipses after her down the narrow corridor lined with huge windows that look out onto the desert. The house, which appears to be small and simple on the outside, 
grows larger and more convoluted as he goes along. Indeed, is it a veritable maze, perhaps good for extended games of hide and seek, or just a place to get lost in? So anyway, she hires him, um, and Miguel takes this job with his family. Um, and then we, um, so the novel moves historically back and forth in time. And um, one of the things that was really super fun with writing this book was researching Christopher Columbus. Because um, I didn't know this going in, but I mean, Columbus was insane. I mean, he was a maniac. And um, I mean, I read his journals um, of his voyages, and, and clearly they're filled with very sort of troubled things and, and very sort of a tormented megalomaniac who only cared about gold. I mean, all he wanted was to discover, uh, was to get gold. In fact, when he arrived in the Bahamas, um, the natives brought him a, a thing to smoke, rolled up in leaves, and he could smoke it, they could smoke it, and he wasn't interested in tobacco, which no one had ever tried before. He said, no, no, not tobacco, I just want gold. And he found himself among the Taino Indians, which were the Indians of the Caribbean, the native people of the Caribbean. And Columbus didn't, I mean, there are a lot of words in the English language that come from the Taino. Um, you'll probably be surprised to know that, for example, um, hammock, barbecue, canoe, all these kind of nice leisure things, those come from the Taino Indians, as does the word hurricane, which is a strong wind. But the Taino Indians had no word for gold. They didn't know what gold was. They'd never seen gold, and that's all that Columbus wanted. And he exploited them. He killed them. He did horrible things just to get gold so he could bring it back, so he could go on more voyages because his only purpose was to discover China and to be an incredibly famous, amazingly you know, adored explorer. Um, he was a very bad explorer, but he was a very good navigator. I mean, that was his true gift. He could navigate. He navigated by the stars. He navigated by dead reckoning. Um, he had a very good sense of where true west or true north was. He could get you anywhere. But he didn't realize that um, between um, the Mediterranean and China, there was another continent called North America, and there was another ocean called the Pacific Ocean. So he kind of missed that when he was doing his navigation. Um, one thing that was really fun when I was doing the research for this book, I got to travel around a lot. I got a, a, a really good grant from my college, and so I traveled to lots of different places. And the map that Columbus used to um, come to America is actually in the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris. And I went to Seville, and I went to um, southern Spain to sort of look at a lot of the Columbus places. And in fact, the scene in this next, this next scene I'm going to read to you is a place that I went to in, um, in Spain but I went to the library, and um, so in order to get into the map room of the Bibliothèque Nationale, you have to prove that you're a scholar. Well, I had an ID from Sarah Lawrence College where I teach, and I told them that I was a scholar, which I really am not, exactly, um, and they gave me a pass to the map room, and they, they brought out this 500-year-old-plus uh, map that Columbus supposedly drew, um, and it was incredible, and it was the size of, like, you know, it was, it, it's, it's very, very big. It's probably, I don't know, four by six or something like that. And I was able to spend the afternoon looking at this insane map that Columbus drew. And I'm going to read you a little bit about it that will tell you about the map. Um, but the fact that he discovered anything is, is a miracle. But the, you know, there are two myths that I, that I hope to debunk with this book. One of them was that the pilgrims weren't first. And the other was, I mean, not only the native peoples, but also the crypto Jews um, came here 100 years before the pilgrims. But so that's one narrative. Um, and the other was that Columbus was a great explorer, and he wasn't. So, um, so this chapter, and again, I'm going to read a short section. So Colum Columbus hired an interpreter. OK, Columbus believed that he was going to discover China. That was his whole deal. He wanted to get to China. And he decided that he needed a Jewish interpreter who could speak Hebrew, Arabic, and other uh, Middle Eastern languages, as well as Spanish and Portuguese, who could um, negotiate with the Arabic and Hebrew traders that they were going to find when they got to China. Now, I don't really understand the logic of that, but I'm just telling you what I know historically. OK, so Columbus needed an interpreter, and he hired a man who is historical in this book. There are several historical figures, and he hired a man named Luis de Torres. 
and Luis de Torres is a crypto Jew. He left his family back in Murcia, Spain, and he walked to Palos de la Frontera um, just days before Columbus was to sail, and he was hired as an interpreter. One of the very interesting things about Columbus's trip to America is that it coincided almost identically with the date when the Jews and Muslims were expelled. Um, why that happened, I don't know exactly. I have lots of theories about it, but Columbus did take at least two crypto Jews on this trip. He took others on other voyages, and on his second voyage, he made landfall in Lisbon before he went back to Spain, and people I've talked to surmise that he did that to let the secret Jews and Muslims off his ship because they couldn't go to Spain. So again, this is a little bit theoretical and a lot of, a lot of things aren't known, but anyway, as a novelist and a storyteller, I sort of took the story, and so anyway, here I go. So this is Luis de Torres. He has left his family. Um, he has walked for several weeks to arrive at a place called um, La Rabida, and La Rabida is a monastery in, um, near Palos de la Frontera. Um, I have been there, it's a very interesting place, and that is where Columbus spent years um, planning his journey. Luis de Torres stands in the dust and heat before the black iron door. He knocks but hears nothing. He knocks again and at last there is a shuffling of feet. The large door is opened and a small friar in a brown cassock, so thick for a hot day, stands before him bowing. Luis is about to speak, but there is no need. The friar knows who he is. They have been expecting him. Without a word, the friar steps aside. Luis follows him into the sudden coolness of the monastery. At first, Luis can say nothing. For weeks, his eyes have gazed into the glare of the sun. Here it is all shadows. As his eyes adjust, he sees that he's come into a courtyard with 12 small doors. These are the doors of the friars, one for each of the apostles. Without a word, the friar leads Luis into a room where he is shown a place to relieve himself, to bathe his hands and face and his feet. He is given a cloth with which to dry. When he comes out into this small anteroom, a chunk of crusty bread, a plate of cheese, and fig jam await him with a bladder of cold water and a goblet of sweet red wine. Mercifully, there is no ham that he would have to force himself to swallow. He drinks the water and then the wine. He eats voraciously until his hands are sticky with jam. Then he rinses them again. As the friar leads him up the stairs, Luis stops at the chapel where he kneels before the Virgin of the Miracles and says his prayers to himself in Hebrew. When he rises, he follows the friar up a flight of stone stairs into a room in which several men sit around a long, dark wooden table and chairs. Despite the stifling heat, the men wear high white collars and wool capes. As Louise steps forward, they gaze at this slightly built man wearing only trousers and a soiled linen tunic. The room is large and filled with light and air. Its windows are flung open and a warm breeze blows through. Louise breathes in the brine of the sea. As Luis de Torres approaches the table, a pale-skinned man with a shock of white hair and pale blue eyes rises, rises to greet him. In front of him is a long tube of rolled parchment. Though he is not a friar, the man is dressed in friar's robes. For an instant, Luis takes him for a ghost. But the explorer is not surprised to see him. Christopher Columbus has received a message that a speaker of Hebrew would be asking to board his ship. Columbus does not look at Luis. He pays no attention to the soiled tunic, his knapsack, or the blisters that ooze on his arms and neck. The Admiral of the Ocean Sea motions for Luis de Torres to sit down. I am in need of a translator, Columbus says, someone who can speak the language of your dark race. Luis is surprised by his high-pitched voice. It is as if he is listening to a boy, not someone of his own age. Columbus explains that when they reach the Orient, they will meet Jewish traders, those who travel the Silk Route importing slave girls and eunuchs, furs and swords, and bring back cinnamon and musk and camphor. It is my intention, Columbus explains, to find the sea route to the east. We will trade with your people in the goods I will require. I am a speaker of Hebrew, Arabic, Aramaic, Spanish, Latin, and Portuguese, Luis de Torres says. Columbus nods as he un unrolls the parchment. It is large and covers the wooden table, and Luis can barely hide his excitement as Columbus lays before him the portal on map he has drawn. 
I have spent years thinking of this journey, Columbus says, as he shows Luis his vision of the world. Columbus has read the journals of Marco Polo and studied the Book of Splendor. He learned that Sardinia is known for its curative fountains, but if a rogue drinks from one, he will go blind. In Cathay, werewolves sacrifice humans and worship Mars, and then the lower situate, the women go to war and the men do housework. From all he has read, Columbus drew this map, which he displays before Luis de Torres. He intends to use it to chart his journey. Luis leans closer for a better look. It consists of two seemingly unrelated maps. To the far left is the world surrounded by nine circles. The first seven are the spheres of the moon, Mercury, Venus, the sun, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. The eighth circle bears the signs of the zodiac. The ninth sphere is empty. To the right is the known world of the Mediterranean and the Atlantic. If he squints, for his eyes still burn from the walk to La Rabida, he can see that the map is cluttered with tiny drawings of towns, from the towns, minarets, ramparts, turrets, churches with crosses, medieval towers, ancient domes rise with no particular rhyme or reason. There are churches in Madagascar and minarets in France. Over Africa, the Portuguese flag flies, and ostrich feathers grace the Sahara. Far to the north is Frixlandia. Luis points and Columbus explains that Frixlandia is a land of ice and snow with high mountains and inhospitable terrain where six months out of the year the inhabitants dwell in mud hovels and live on frozen fish. Farther to the right are the fabled isles of the seven, seven cities whose shores sailors claim was made of pure gold. Below the isles of the seven cities, there is nothing but the open sea. Pointing to the empty space in the map, Columbus tells Luis, this is the unknown world from which we will sail. And with that, Luis understands that he has been hired for this voyage. Then Columbus points to a tiny island off the coast of Asia. It is surrounded by rocks and seems to be at the very end of the world. Luis has to bend forward to see it more clearly, and he reads the name of this tiny island that Columbus has written in his own hand. He has called it Paradise. This journey is taking them to heaven. As Luis de Torres gazes at the map, it occurs to him that he may be sailing off with a madman. I just want to tell you one last anecdote about why I decided to write this book. Um, about seven or eight years ago, my husband and I, I'd forgotten all about the crypto Jews. I'd forgotten about the babysitter, all of it. About five or six years ago, we went to Girona, Spain, and there's a, a museum of the, of the old Jewish ghetto. And um, again, I'm, fa I'm fascinated with the question of, of, of secret histories and buried histories. And we went to this museum, and I have to say it was probably the stupidest museum I've ever been to. It had things like um, Jews wear hats when they pray, um, Jews eat flatbread at Easter, and then Jews, um, Jews are good farmers and merchants. That was kind of the museum. But the thing about the museum was it all stopped in 1492. It didn't go past 1492. No explanation. It just stopped. So I'm that kind of girl. And I went up to the information person. I speak good Spanish. And I said, hey, what happened after 1492? Like, what's the deal? And she goes, oh, we haven't gotten to that room yet. And I really felt like I wanted to get to that room, and I feel like you know diving into this history was really kind of my way to get there. So anyway, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, it's really wonderful to be here uh, at the library tonight, and um, and and particularly with Mary. Uh, our novels are very different, as you will be able to tell uh, as I read a little bit. The voice is different, sounds are different, the rhythms are different. And yet, there's an extraordinary thematic convergence that hopefully we'll get to talk about uh, in the next few minutes when I finish up and we can sit in those chairs and, and, and have a discussion. So thank you to Andy and the library staff as well for putting this event together. It's, um, it's really interesting. Uh, the library, this library where we're sitting right now or standing as I am, uh, is kind of important in this book. Uh, there's several scenes that take place in Everything is Borrowed. And it is here in this building where we're all right now uh, that the protagonist and the narrator, Nicholas Moskowitz, begins his journey of exploration 
toward, I have here written recovery, towards his way back to um, figuring out what he's going to do with his life, how to live a just and useful life. So it's really, all that said, I mean, it's great to be here uh, in the building where so many important things in the book take place. As a novel, Everything is Borrowed is formed from the following ideas. And some of you who are here tonight are familiar with my work, and you know that these ideas are reflected in practically everything, and you're probably sick of hearing about them. But I'll say them anyway. Um, the city, like a book, can be read. That's one idea. Could be true. Maybe it's made up. The second idea is this. The city, like a life, collects in layers. So this is a, a novel about uh, someone who is going to dig through those layers as a way to figure out what, what he's doing with his life, how he's approaching his work, how he's approaching his loneliness, and, and trying to recover uh, as a human being. This is a novel about an architect from the present day. So just as Mary's book um, has a kind of present day story, though hers takes place in 1992, uh, there is a present day story in this book, and then there is a recent past story, which takes place in 1991, another kind of connection, and then an historical story. So this is a novel about an architect from the present day, Nicholas Moskowitz, and an anarchist from over a century ago, and his name, which uh, Nicholas doesn't get at first, he has to figure it out, is Julius Moskowitz, or Moskowitz, or Muskowitz, or it's spelled all kinds of different ways throughout history. And here, here we have these two things, anarchists and architects. So anarchists, as we think of them today in our uh, present day uh, concept of politics, in our common imagination, are people who tear down, right? They, they rip things apart. They wear black, and they get angry, and they get violent. Uh, and they destroy things, right? That's When we think about anarchists, we think about no control and everything going crazy. And this reputation truly does come from a desire among anarchists, philosophical desire, to remove the state, to remove religion and control, to remove corporate control in the contemporary context, and to start over as human beings. But anarchism really, if you take all of that stuff away, represents a belief and a philosophy about nurturing organic community. That human beings, if they were left to themselves without um, the structures of the state, of the structures of politics, the structures of the corporate uh, system, would get together in an organic way, share property, live together, but do so with a high regard for personal freedom. And in a sense, anarchism as a philosophy is about building up. And I learned this the more I read about it and the more I, I tried to get an understanding of what it meant. Now, architects, of course, are who we think are supposed to be the builders up, right? And yet in this book, as I'm playing with these concepts, the architect Nicholas Moskowitz has hit a creative block. He struggles particularly with how to practice his profession in an authentic, original, and just way. This is a kind of Jewish struggle for him. There's something very Jewish about it, particularly how to do things in a just way. And to go forward with his life and with his profession, he needs to tear things down. So here we have the architect tearing things down. He needs to tear down his own practice. He needs to tear down the commission he's supposed to be working on and which he's avoiding at all costs and in the rubble of all of that to try to rebuild what he's doing. In this struggle to do all of that, he discovers a man with the same last name as him, Julius Moskowitz who has come to the United States in the 1880s, uh, and as a some point, who knows, in his young life, he's in his 20s, becomes an anarchist. Uh, and by assembling the, from the architecture of Julius's life, 
from the scant historical record. I mean, it's no different in trying to figure out what Columbus was thinking than uh, what this uh, man from the late 19th century, who was a real historic figure, an actual person, who came to Philadelphia, probably from Romania, and, uh, and, and lived his whole life here. Um, he, he's pulling the pieces of Julius's life together as a way to borrow it and to, and to build his own life. Um, he discovers, Nicholas, the architect, who's supposed to be building a building on a site on Bainbridge Street, he discovers that in 1889, just across the street, Julius, dressed uh, for prayer on Yom Kippur in a white outfit, and that white outfit signifies purity, that Julius has set up his peddler stand in the Washington Market, which used to be between 3rd and 5th Streets on Bainbridge Street. And in front of the Love of Mercy Synagogue, he sets up his peddler stand on, on Yom Kippur. Now, working on the holy day is completely forbidden, no matter what you do, if you're a Jew, and Julius was a Jew. And he stands there facing the synagogue, and he recites his anarchist tracts. I don't know what they were. I don't think anyone does. The historical record is, is pretty loose. But we can imagine that they were the words of the anarchist Johann Most who spent a lot of time in New York and Philadelphia in that period. And the words that he were reciting were what we called a pure prayer. So here we have Julius Moskowitz standing in front of the synagogue saying, reciting his pure prayer when he should be doing nothing but praying inside the synagogue, according to the religious. This was a taunt. He knew exactly what he was doing. He was put up to it by the other anarchists. He agreed to do it. It was meant to torture those, those religious Jews and bring them down. It was aimed at the powerful. Uh, and in those days, many of the anarchists in America were Jews and Italians, uh, immigrants in New York and Philadelphia and then ultimately in Chicago. And many of them focused their actions on this, on this stranglehold of religious tradition, which represented to them authority, um, arbitrary and unreasonable power, and subjugation. And so it was an easy target. There was the synagogue built by other immigrants, and he could aim at it. Uh, so this is a very public protest. Uh, well, what happens? And this is the seed of, um, just like Mary had this, a seed that, that gave forth her book, which was hiring a babysitter. I read about this that Julius Moskowitz, or someone, or maybe Louis Moskowitz, it's not clear what his name was, stood outside that synagogue in some year in the 18, late 19th century, it's not clear when, because there is no actual record of it, uh, and recited his prayer and angered the religious Jews inside the synagogue so much that they poured forth from the synagogue and assaulted him. The policemen who were on the corner probably Irish, had probably no idea what was going on. They couldn't understand the language. They couldn't understand the context for what they were seeing. And what do they do? They arrest the religious on the holiest day of the year, and they take them away in the paddy wagon. This, these kinds of things happened quite frequently in that era. Uh, discovering this incident forces our architect, Nicholas, to face a similar kind of act from his own past. And in that reckoning, and in borrowing from Julius' life, Julius's life as he pieces it together, Nicholas begins to see how he, as a man in his 40s, present day city, how he can piece his life together and go forward, how he might start again. And Yom Kippur, after all, is that time of, of rebirth and new beginnings. So in conceiving of this novel, I wanted to ask how a person can account for the presence of the past, or even multiple pasts in his or her own life. And, and I think that's something like what Mary is doing. The past is, is present, right? We, we, we live, we don't just live in the now. Genetically, as human beings, we're old material. Our built environments, uh, as many of you in the audience know, I might think this, were built by others a long time ago. And those buildings, built by others a long time ago, actually reek of those people who built them. 
and we kind of insert ourselves into, into their world. Uh, we are often also trapped by personal memory. And yet, as human beings, desperate to survive, we, we live with our eyes on the future. And so this tension that can't, as a novelist, as a, someone trying to make sense of this, doesn't work in a, in a, narrative, a simple narrative progression. Our lives don't work that way. And so I've attempted to tell the story of Nicholas, the architect in the present day, and Julius in the historical past, and in the recent past, which Nicholas has to face his own acts of cruelty as a younger man, about the same age as Julius, um, and in the present as well, so these three time periods, as if it was all in the present. And something that's very similar about our two books is that they're both told completely in the present tense. With time kind of swirling around and with the lives of the living and the dead kind of reverberating, with the protagonist, Nicholas, provoking the streets for answers, the streets, the buildings, the rooms, rooms which both trap and distill time, and he's demanding of those places which are meaningful to him or not, maybe they were meaningful also to Julius, to tell him what those rooms know. And it's in this sense that Nicholas is borrowing from the city around him. All of that, those layers, to me, and some of you out there know this, I struggled with what to present tonight. This is the first night of presenting this book, and publisher is here, a wonderful person who designed the cover is here, Miriam. And so this is my first chance to present this book tonight. How do I present it when there's time so strangely integrated through the text, and I struggled with that. So we'll see how we do, right? And I'll read a, a few passages. Um, the book, in its layers, as in the city, as in a human life, seems to mount as time goes on, and that's, that's a little bit of my struggle. So we'll start with a short passage from the beginning. As Nicholas confronts the architectural commission to design an apartment house on what is now a parking lot. The developer who's hired him's name is Armin Terzian. And in contemplating the job, very quickly, Nicholas is drawn into his own memories of the parking lot itself. He's been there. Things have important in his life have happened there and in the neighborhood around it. The surface of Terzian's parking lot is rough and ugly, like a gash in the street, it exposes the membranes of the city. Light isn't supposed to penetrate into the interior of the block. And I imagine the scars can't be healed by the sun. The voice, by the way, is in Nicholas's voice. He's the narrator. He's the architect. You aren't supposed to see the half-tumbling back garden walls of the buildings that ring the parking lot. The morning glories are meant to be private. You shouldn't see the broken skin caked with asphalt and caked over again, weeds rupturing the surface of the lot like lesions of some inexorable disease. Except maybe it's beautiful. The chimney of a missing row house like a ghost or a memory. A pitched roof propped hesitantly in a horizon of straight lines, stucco below giving way. Now only the outline remains of an alley that must have run west from 4th Street into the center of the block. If I look at an old map, what will it be called? Bigelow or Constantine? Why am I hesitant to cover all this up? Strange question for an architect to ask. According to my client, Armin Terzian, what he envisions is very simple. 35 apartments and two retail stores, some social space for the tenants, a place for their bikes, an exercise room, a rooftop pool, parking, but what, where, where will it go? Digging in my mind as I try to imagine the project before me, I also begin to dig through the layers of history. A city, like a person's life, collects like a delta. Years ago, on Thursday nights, we would come down here and drink at a bar on a narrow, dark corner. In those days, we drove. I don't know why, because we couldn't afford taxis. In those days, the subway ran 24 hours, but we never considered it. We always drove. When we couldn't find a spot on the street, we paid $3 and parked here in this same lot. The parking lot attendant comes over. He asks if I need any help. His voice is kind, almost like a whisper. 
almost a whisper, and his eyes are searching and kind. Can't find your car? He is African or possibly Caribbean. He holds his hands together at his heart, the four fingers of the right hand between the left thumb and index finger, a prayer grip. I don't want to tell him I'm going to obliterate his lot. The phrase fill in the void comes to mind, but the emptiness, too, is a volume filled with meaning. I shake my head instead. Having a look, I say, finally. The asphalt is so hot, it seems to swell underfoot. The buildings that line the parking lot on the western edge are on Passyunk Avenue. I walk around to it, mostly a charming row of shops, but I sense a haggardness also, a place tired of itself. I wonder if the height of the apartment house could be pushed up, even another story beyond Terzian's five stories on the interior of the site, if I can maintain a three-story edge at the street. The spatial difference could be made up with a terrace at the fourth story, a picture of the terrace with its greenery and tables, umbrellas and lounge chairs comes to mind, and in that moment, with the sun lowering yet still far above the buildings, a fierce and lonely ache presses in behind my eyes. I recognize it, for nowadays I can see it coming from a far distance, a terrifying fear of my own impotence and unoriginality. I return to the interior of the parking lot and drift toward the guard shack. Platicar is a Spanish word a colleague at my old firm taught me once long ago. His name was Rodrigo Ramirez. You have to chat up a client, the client's mother, the client's wife, the client's little dog, he said. We have a word for it, for it, platicar, platicando, an effortless word that settles so easily on the tongue. I wish to platicar the guard, to be close to him for only a moment, somehow to compensate for the sterile state of my mind. But the guard isn't there. A cheap desk fan rocks back and forth inside the shack letting out a tiny wail each time it turns. The fan is perfectly illuminated, isolated in the sun's golden hour, as if in a vintage photograph of a backwater southern county seat, or a tourist gaze through a window of old Havana. I recall our old bar this way, a hidden jewel in a half-open box. The memory of the colors of bottles in the shelf behind the bar reminds me now of a candy display in the old city of Jerusalem in a dark sook strung with beads, the graffiti on the outside walls of the bar, and all the way down the alley was like this too when illuminated by the headlights of a car. In ordinary light, the alley walls were dark and sad in those days, as if the vibrant color of the graffiti lines had been discolored by soot and filth and also disappointment. Years later, watching the film Mikey and Nikki, I discover these same streets again, barren and cold as they were in 1976 when that film came out. I leave the parking lot and turn east toward, a, toward our old bar. I switch to the shady side of the street and back again. The corner that I'm certain is where our bar used to be is now a restaurant, Cabo Biche. I've seen the same restaurant with the same name and sign set in the same typeface in West Philadelphia, where we lived in those days when we came all the way down here at night. The other Cabo Biche at 42nd and Chestnut, a corner that always seemed forlorn and damaged, is in an old stainless steel diner car that has been almost completely hidden beneath stucco walls and cinder block. Only the shape remains, trapped beneath the sharp lines of the new beige exterior, another ghost form of the street. The Cabo Biche on Chestnut Street serves Indian and Pakistani food, at least as I recall. The Cabo Biche on 4th Street, in the storefront that was in the old days, our favorite bar, served Turkish food, Turkish and Mediterranean cuisine, it says. On Chestnut Street, I have always thought Indian is intentionally misleading. I have maybe the owners think no one will want Pakistani food because they won't know what it is. Sometimes. The city is hard to read. So Nicholas's just barely permeating memories are mostly of an old girlfriend from college named Ava, or Eva, who, has, who he has wronged once in the past. And, he, and he, this, this situation is latent inside of him. It's, it's dormant until, until he's reminded 
of it by Julius, and also of a friend, a close friend named Reginald. His office associate in the present day is a young architect named Nadia Chamoun, and Nadia for him evokes Eva, his old girlfriend, in powerful ways. So let me just read a little bit from that, and we'll move ahead. Nadia is getting frustrated already with Nicholas, who uh, isn't doing what he's supposed to do, which is design this building. Back in the office, Nadia pays me no attention. In the US for six years, she hasn't lost her circumflex eyebrows or her mini skirts. On the other hand, as she likes to say, she knows where she is from, a dusty ruins. She holds a stare longer than anyone else I have ever met. She wears a scarf often in jewel tones, to hold back her chestnut hair from her face like a peasant or a revolutionary. Nadia leans through the doorway into my private office. Today she's wearing a short sleeve blue purple top and a silver ring with a large amethyst stone and chalky eye makeup with a hint of violet. The color coordination is subtler than describing it here in distant, isolated words makes it seem in her earthiness, Nadia makes such intention seem natural and easy, a second thought. And so I'm supposed to take no note of the color connection. It is, after all, flatter in color for her desert complexion. And yet to forget it, too, as if she herself is an example of effortless design, like a room so contented you forget it has walls. The brown skin of her arms and her neck below the chin is like coffee, her hair chestnut, her eyes cinnamon, like Eva's. Coffee, chestnut, cinnamon. Back in those days in our bar, Eva and Reginald and I would laugh at such sorry cliches. We called them cheesy, a favorite word then. The cheesiness lent irony. We could be cheesy, it was in our power. It was in our power to mock others who were actually cheesy. We stood above and beyond. Now the cliche is only that, a sign of laziness the incapacity to see in specificity, the slow machinations of a near middle-aged brain. The first time I noticed Nadia from a distance in a crowded seminar room, I saw Eva. I felt her presence as if she were there and I couldn't control my gaze. The coffee skin, the chestnut hair, the cinnamon eyes. This page from my past bleeds through to the present. Perhaps it has been bleeding all along. So Nicholas um, is here in the library, right here, uh, when he should be working on the Terzian Commission. And that's when he learns of Julius Moskowitz, the anarchist, and the provo provocation in front of Love of Mercy Synagogue. True. Uh, so here's the way that Nicholas describes that scene of the religious coming out to assault Julius. He mentions the word gas. The gas is, is their metaphorical fuel of their fanaticism, of his fanaticism as an anarchist. And I'll describe that scene and then I'll read you one more passage and then we'll talk. L uh, Moskowitz, in his shawl and in his robe, davens an anti-prayer on Yom Kippur, 1889. That's how I see it, the open text lying back like spread legs on the wooden library table in stardust air. The shadow of the bull-like man rocks in the clarifying autumn light, words emitting like a startling wind. Inside the synagogue, with the temperature rising, a group of men, certainly, even thicker and heavier than Moskowitz, as I imagine him, pushes through the door and into the north-facing shadow. It is cool. God has struck the humidity. But now the thick Maduro air, in the shade at least, is becoming brittle. What a sensation! Springs opposite is also a gift of life. Two of them catch a look at Moskowitz. The gas hits. They forget their whisper prayers, the meaning of them, not the sound, which now intensifies Moskowitz's and theirs, Moskowitz's and theirs. They're praying, he's praying differently, which now intensifies Moskowitz's and theirs as they come closer, back into the light, first the two and then others. He doesn't move except his lips, the bull, which is how Nicholas starts to think of Julius, gives no ground. Their limbs, because of the gas, shake and welter. Spittle emits in self-betrayal, 
from their shovel tongues. They're from the town of Shavel in Lithuania. One of the men grabs hold of Moskowitz's book of Johann Most. Another claws at the sacred fringe of the shawl, and between his own fringe and Moskowitz's fringe, the threads intermix like high school mouths, like first-time deviants. The, viol the violation of the sacred day is like a filament shuddering alive. Now there is gas, and now there is current. No prayerful man is safe from himself. The men, now six or eight of them, completely erase the distance between themselves and Moskowitz, who is standing in front of his peddler stand. Head coverings fall to the dusty ground. The Johann Most drops too. A foot drags across the back of Moskowitz's knees, and whispering still, the anarchist catches himself. Does he call out, for the love of mercy? It doesn't say. But the look of the whole exchange as witnessed by a policeman on the corner elicits an instant response. The religious are thrown in a paddy wagon and swept away for disturbing the peace. Okay, one more short reading. Oh, let me, let me finish that for a minute. There's a little bit more. Hang on, sorry about that. Where did it go? Goodness. Nicholas goes on. The library is full of whispers, but one, a dark-skinned man with plump fingers, shiny as kidneys, with a pile of books before him, has been whispering since I arrived in the reading room. It isn't clear if he is reading aloud. Moskowitz. Harry Boonin, who's a local historian and whose book has the story of Moskowitz at the synagogue, calls him the apostate, but with cheek to set up a narrative turn. One day, he will walk away from the radical life to become the leader of the Jewish Burial Society. Quote, its membership included the most devout and God-fearing in the community. So Nicholas is uh, really sucked into figuring out Julius' story and thinking about how it relates to his own life, doing anything but what Nadia and the developer, Terzian, are demanding of him. And in actuality, what he's doing is slowly reconfiguring himself and his life. He doesn't have children. He's never been a parent. And yet he seems to be borrowing Julius's children for his own as he learns that story. So here he is imagining Julius walking home from prison. Two years after that scene in front of the synagogue, Julius actually is arrested. The religious get back at him. They frame him at another anarchist protest on the Yom Kippur of 1891. He's thrown into jail and he spends some time in jail. Uh, and so now Julius is, um, Julius is walking home from prison. He's been released after being there for eight months. And I'll read that and then we'll talk. In early November, Moskowitz walks out of the gate of Moyamensing prison, turns left, looks down at his feet, and walks up Pasyank Avenue. It is cold, and he doesn't have a coat. He turns down Young's Court, images of Minnie, Janie, Dora, and Mary crowding his vision. If you dreamed of redemption, Julius, this must be why. I sit in my silent office, tracing Moskowitz's steps on the computer screen. The maps are silent. Also, no people, no street noise. The buildings are pink or yellow, squares or rectangles. Pink for brick, yellow for wood. The atlas doesn't show the awnings that stretch from the face of every commercial and retail building to the curb's edge. Nor can you see courtyard gates, fire escapes, lampposts, and laundry lines, nor stoops, usually only two steps high on these impoverished streets, nor marble, sla nor marble slabs nor window ledges, nor balconies, nor slate paving stones, nor signs in English or Yiddish, nor posters advertising concerts and meetings, nor push carts, nor balsam baskets of fruit, nor horses pulling delivery carts, nor goats, nor dogs, nor long dresses, filthy aprons, broken shutters, nor wash basins, cellar grates, cobblestones, nor children crowding doorways, sideways, peddling in mother's arms, on the courtyard floor. 
Who is waiting on Young's court for Julius? Minnie, wife, age 28. Janie, daughter, age 8. Dora, daughter, age 7. Mary, daughter, age 5. These are based on the 1900 census. So this is what Nicholas Moskowitz is doing. Instead of designing a building, he's caught up in this web of research on his computer screen. Dora is only, Dora the second daughter, Dora is only mentioned in the 1900 census. The 1900 census is the oldest existing record of the Moskowitz family and closest to 1892, which is where we are in the story. A book of old photographs published a century later in 1983 reveals the t lives of the immigrant poor, the photographs of blacks, Jews, and Italians in this very neighborhood, in ramshackle courtyards and alleys, are analogs for the redlining maps of the 1930s. Children with their filthy faces and hands wear rough cotton clothing. They have no shoes. In one photograph, a child stands in front of the old Washington market after it's been torn down, replaced with sickly trees and bushes. He faces east toward Love of Mercy Synagogue. The boy holds a basket. With a heavy coat and a wool cap, he is a peddler. Around the corner on the graffiti-covered alley where Eva escapes my proposal, a photographer, a hundred years before, has captured two dozen children. The photograph is taken in summer. The children are looking into the light. Like distant ghosts, they are overexposed. <laughs>